As part of this series on the practical and evidence-based physical exam, today I'll be discussing the measurement and interpretation of the heart rate as part of the assessment of vital signs. I know some of you may be thinking, the heart rate, really? That's such a straightforward and boring topic. But I guarantee this video will teach you something new. With the heart rate, the term itself presents the very first point of complication you may not have previously considered. While some clinicians default to the term heart rate, others use the term pulse or pulse rate. Are these synonymous? Well, almost, but not quite. And it's an important distinction because the term used in documentation implies the method that was used to measure it. Here's what I mean. The term heart rate implies the number of times per minute that the heart physically beats, or more specifically, how many times per minute the ventricles contract. The most common technique to measure this on exam would be to listen to the heart with a stethoscope and count the number of times one hears the first and second heart sounds within a specific length of time. However, when someone refers to the pulse, that implies it was measured by feeling a peripheral pulse in a patient's artery. The vast majority of the time, the heart rate and the pulse are the same value, but fast irregular rhythms are an exception. During a fast irregular rhythm, such as poorly controlled atrial fibrillation, if two successive contractions of the heart occur too close together, there will be a relatively low amount of blood in the left ventricle for the second contraction because it hasn't yet had enough time to fill. The result is that for that one beat, the outward flow of blood may be too little or too weak to be palpated in a peripheral artery by an examiner. Therefore, the pulse in rapid irregular rhythms can be lower than the heart rate. The difference between the two is referred to as the pulse deficit. Although the distinction between heart rate and pulse isn't relevant for most patients, it is very relevant for hospitalized patients with arrhythmias. So you do need to be sure to use the correct term based on the method of measurement. For the sake of convenience, I'll be referring to this as the heart rate for the remainder of this video. Regarding the actual details in the methods of measurement, it's really nothing more than either listening to the heart or feeling the pulse in a peripheral artery. The peripheral artery most commonly chosen is the radial because it's convenient and easy to find. However, in patients with severe hypotension, it may not be palpable requiring palpation of the femoral or carotid arteries instead. The only other common question that comes up regarding the actual measurement is for how long do you assess it? Typically, a clinician would either listen or palpate for 15 seconds and multiply by four to arrive at the number of beats per minute. However, for unusually slow rhythms or highly irregular rhythms, it is slightly more accurate to observe for 20 seconds and multiply by three or for 30 seconds and multiply by two. Be aware that in the hospital, it is extremely common, perhaps even universal, that the number for the rate that's recorded in patient charts by medical staff was taken from either a cardiac monitor, in which case it's the heart rate, or from a pulse oximeter or automated blood pressure cuff, in which case it's the pulse rate. Now that we have a value taken via some method, we need to compare it to the normal range. So what is the normal range for the heart rate? Well, if you've had any formal medical training, and maybe even if you haven't, you learned along the way that the normal range for the resting heart rate in adults is 60 to 100 beats per minute. This is the range in physical exam textbooks. It's the range listed on almost all layperson facing health websites, and the range that is even part of the formal definition of normal sinus rhythm. However, that range is wrong. Don't believe me? Consider some evidence. The largest relevant direct study was one from 2007 that looked at ECGs from 46,000 adults who had been categorized as having a low probability of cardiovascular disease. They found a median heart rate of 68 beats per minute with 96% of individuals falling between 48 and 98. Consider this histogram of heart rates in this population. 
just from eyeballing it, does 60 to 100 seem like the most accurate range for what's considered normal? Beyond what the median heart rate is in a healthy population, there's also the question of what heart rate range is associated with longevity in the future, which is a marker of people who are healthy. A 1990 study looked at the association between heart rate and mortality in 1,800 patients who were admitted to the hospital with a heart attack. This graph shows the patient's mortality in the first year after the heart attack as a function of the final recorded heart rate immediately prior to hospital discharge. We see that the mortality for heart rates of 50 through 89 are uniform, but once the rate at discharge creeps above 90, mortality starts to climb pretty rapidly. But the danger of faster heart rates isn't limited to just patients who've had heart attacks. In a study of 56,000 patients without known heart disease, the faster the resting heart rate, the increased risk of a major adverse cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack or cardiac arrest. And this trend persisted even after statistical adjustments were made to account for the presence of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, obesity, and lung disease. So even if one believed that resting heart rates within the range of 90 to 100 are statistically within two standard deviations of average, which they probably aren't, they don't seem to be markers of good health. In addition to large studies of patients, there's also expert opinion. In 1992, a survey was sent to 150 cardiologists, which asked whether the limits of the so-called normal heart rate should be changed from 60 to 100, and if so, what the new range should be. 136 cardiologists responded, of whom 123 agreed with a proposal of 50 to 90, six had a preference of for 50 to 100, and only two preferred the original range. The remaining five had a variety of subtly different preferences, all of which were overall slower than 60 to 100. So if all the evidence on what should be considered the normal range for the heart rate points more to 50 to 90 than 60 to 100, why does everyone believe it's 60 to 100? Like all myths, this one has an origin somewhere. You just won't believe how arbitrary this particular one was. In 1928, a committee of cardiologists belonging to the New York Tuberculosis and Health Association created the first edition of a book originally known as Criteria for Classification and Diagnosis of Heart Disease, intended to create consensus definitions and criteria for cardiovascular pathology. This was in the earliest days of electrocardiography, also known as ECGs, or in the U.S. as EKGs. Cardiologists performing research on and discovering the clinical applications of this new technology needed to ensure that they were using new terms all in the same way. In this book, they defined something called regular sinus rhythm as, quote, the normal rhythm of the heart originating in the sinus node. The average rate in healthy individuals lies between 60 and 80 per minute at rest. My interpretation of that definition is that 60 to 80 was never intended to be specific criteria per se. The second and third editions of this book made no changes to the name or definition of regular sinus rhythm. However, in 1946, the newly reorganized New York Heart Association published the fourth edition of the book, now renamed Nomenclature and Criteria for Diagnosis of Diseases of the Heart. In this edition, regular sinus rhythm was renamed normal sinus rhythm and given a range of 60 to 100 with wording that felt more like specific criteria than previously. This was still long before population studies on normal heart rates. So why was this range chosen and labeled, quote, normal? Well, as put by Charles Kosman, an early member of that group, it was for, quote, the purposes of standardizing electrocardiographic nomenclature these limits and terminologies are used principally for convenience and uniformity of designation. They do not define normality except in a gross way. In other words, it was an educated guess made for convenience. And why was 60 to 100 the convenient range? It was most likely based on the standard speed with which electrocardiograms are printed on standard graph paper. Even by the 1940s, ECGs tended to be printed on graph paper subdivided into bold 5mm 
and fine one millimeter boxes, most commonly at a rate of 25 millimeters per second. This means that every large box represents 200 milliseconds. These sharp deflections, known as QRS complexes, are the electrical activity that triggers ventricular contraction. Using just a bit of math, we can derive an equation to quickly estimate the heart rate as 300 divided by the number of large boxes in between QRS complexes. So if there are five large boxes, we have a rate of 60 beats per minute. If we have three large boxes, we have a rate of 100 beats per minute. But a rate of 90 results in a physical interval of three large boxes plus one and two thirds small boxes. Even with a magnifying glass and ruler, determining whether or not the distance between QRS complexes exceeds that length is challenging. So picking 60 to 100 back in the 1940s was based on the pre-existing and completely arbitrary decision as to the speed with which ECGs were printed and the size of the grid paper on which that printing was done. That arbitrary decision led to the most pervasive myth in the history of medicine. So in summary, despite what the vast majority of references claim, the primary evidence is most consistent with a normal resting heart rate range in adults of 50 to 90 beats per minute. Now, with that out of the way, let's focus on deviations from normal. An unusually fast rate is called tachycardia. There are multiple frameworks for categorizing the etiologies and mechanisms of tachycardias, but the simplest divides them into two, primary arrhythmias and systemic diseases. Primary arrhythmias include the previously mentioned atrial fibrillation, as well as atrial flutter, ventricular tachycardia, and a large number of others with increasingly complex names. The details of each are far outside the scope of this video, but in almost all of these, the rate is being set by something outside of the sinus node, that is, outside the heart's normal intrinsic pacemaker. Etiologies within systemic diseases all share in common that the rhythm is still originating from the sinus node and still under some degree of control by the body's autonomic nervous system, but the autonomic nervous system is telling the sinus node to fire electrical impulses more quickly than normal. We call this type of tachycardia sinus tachycardia. The potential causes of sinus tachycardia are many, but some common ones are infection, volume depletion, anemia, anxiety, pain, stimulant intoxication, alcohol withdrawal, and heart failure. An unusually slow rate is called bradycardia. Its etiologies can also be subdivided into primary arrhythmias, such as AV block and sick sinus syndrome, and systemic causes such as medication side effects, hypothyroidism, hypothermia, and endurance athletic training. As might be implied by these lists, clinically relevant tachycardia is a more common observation than clinically relevant bradycardia. I'm going to end with some classic pitfalls or mistakes when interpreting a patient's heart rate. First, as extensively discussed, considering an asymptomatic rate of 50 to 60 as pathologic, or failing to identify a rate of 90 to 100 as a potential warning sign of pathology. Using the heart rate as a primary gauge of volume status, while it is true that hypovolemia, that is a reduced blood volume, can cause sinus tachycardia. There are many other confounding causes, including heart failure and volume overload. When assessing for adequate volume resuscitation in a critically ill patient, very little weight should be placed on the heart rate. Approaching atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response as if it had the same clinical significance as sinus tachycardia. While infections, heart failure, drug and alcohol abuse, hyperthyroidism, and even severe psychological distress can all trigger rapid AFib, and you should do a reasonable investigation for those things, sometimes rapid AFib just happens. There isn't always a mystery diagnosis to discover, but sometimes there is. Overzealous response to asymptomatic bradycardia during sleep. If this is observed in a hospitalized patient, check the blood pressure and get an ECG or 
use a cardiac monitor to make sure that the rhythm is simple sinus bradycardia and that you aren't dealing with something called AV block. But asymptomatic bradycardia with a stable blood pressure and an ECG with a normal PR interval and normal QRS complex width, this is not a medical emergency. Even when heart rates dip into the 30s, you don't need to throw pacemaker pads on the patient's chest or tape a syringe of atropine to the wall above the bed. Look for reversible causes and talk to cardiology in the light of day. You do not need to call a rapid response code or wake up the cardiologist at three in the morning. And lastly, not recognizing the effect of meds or medication withdrawal on the heart rate in hospitalized patients. In other words, a patient presenting to the ER with an acute infection is less likely to have tachycardia if they take a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker as an outpatient. Likewise, if a patient on those medications chronically is admitted to the hospital and those meds are held on admission for some reason, it's not uncommon for modest tachycardia to develop two or three days later. One should still investigate the onset of new tachycardia in such patients but just with the recognition of that potential diagnosis of exclusion. That's it for this discussion of the assessment of heart rate. I hope I met my guarantee of teaching you something new. Check out other videos in this series that dispel additional physical exam myths, like the normal ranges for respiratory rate and temperature.